Welcome to SaulCast, where we're talking about Season 5, Episode 4 of Better Call Saul, titled Namaste. This is our instant take. We just watched the episode, so these will be our raw, immediate reactions to having seen it. But make sure to check back later in the week, where we'll have our full recap and analysis. By the way, if you're listening to this as a podcast, check out the link in the show notes where you can watch this as a YouTube video on our channel, One Take. And if you're watching this on YouTube, subscribe to the podcast to get that full recap later in the week. Without further ado, let's jump into tonight's episode. I'm Gil. I'm here with my brothers, Alun. Yo. And Adam. Hello. Let's get into it. So a few things to talk about in tonight's episode. Let's start with the character we ended on, Mike. He went looking for trouble again, found those same hoodlums, and got himself beat up and stabbed. So what is he doing here? Why was he looking to get into another fight? And where do you think he is at the end there? Are they hoodlums or are they punks? Because I wrote punks in my notes. (laughs) <laughs> you called them hoodlums last time. That's why I used the word hoodlum. Oh. <laughs> I got that from you. <laughs> <laughs> I had a change of heart. <laughs> last time, like, Gil, they, well, Gil, are you sure you should call them punks? I think they might be hoodlums. <laughs> <laughs> it's, a t- it's, it's complicated, but what's even more, what's, what's less complicated are the reasons that he even went there. Mm-hmm. I think without without even being trusted to have the responsibility of watching over Kaylee babysitting her. He's got nothing left. He's depressed for him. The, it felt good to get in that altercation last time. So he just kind of went out looking for trouble because uh, he didn't know what else to do. Also, he's been, if it's anything like last time, he's, he's been drinking a lot. And so mm-hmm. uh, probably not making the best decisions. He might've seen a picture of the Sydney opera house. <laughs> yeah. It set him off. <laughs> Well, when he when he was told that he wasn't babysitting that night and he walked away, I literally wrote down in my notes, Mike looks like he's uh, looking for trouble. He had a look on his face that said he wants to hit somebody. Yeah. In addition to all of that, it's possible he also feels he deserves that. Maybe he felt like he hasn't been punished for the wrongdoings he's committed. And maybe this was a way of feeling like. He is uh, getting what he deserves. That was one of my questions. Do you think he went into that fight hoping to win, hoping to lose, or did he just generally not care? I I think he didn't care. Yeah, I mean, I think, honestly, I think he wanted to take out some frustration, but I think he also did kind of want to get beat up a little bit himself. Mm -hmm. And then afterwards, he wakes up in a hospital of some kind. Not exactly a hospital, I guess, but it, almost like a farm of some sort out in the desert. Do you think, who do you think rescued him? Was he rescued? How did he end up there? I have one theory, and that's, I think, given how thorough Gus is, there's a good chance that Mike is under surveillance most of the time. Mm-hmm. Uh, and Gus also seems to like Mike and see him as a, an asset. So there's a, I, I'm not backing this theory hundred percent, but there's a chance that one of Gus's people saw this happen uh, and took him somewhere to convalesce. Yeah. My first thought was maybe they stabbed him. One of the hoodlums or punks realized that he was dying and they thought we don't want to get involved in a murder right now. So let's take this guy back to my place and care for his wounds. Then I realized that doesn't seem very likely. My Mm, next thought is exactly what you said, is that Gus is monitoring him, saw that he was being threatened, and not Gus himself, but one of Gus's people stepped in and saved Mike. But that leads to a question of how much is Gus going to put up with? We know he's going to continue to work with Mike, but he already had the Werner screw up, and now he appears to be borderline suicidal, putting himself into this, this compromising, dangerous position. It'll be interesting to see if Gus really is the one who intervened, how we go from this to Gus saying, yeah, I want to keep working with this unpredictable guy who keeps going out looking for danger. If you Gus know this. Ha- it- Go ahead. 
All right, I was going to say, if Gus was involved in this, it could be, uh, you know, Gus still wants to work with him, and maybe he will be offering Mike a purpose. Mike clearly needs something in his life to, to yes. change at this point. And this is very similar. If, if, the, if Gus is involved in this, it's very similar to what happened, I think, in Season 4 of Breaking Bad when... And Mike was involved in this. He basically, Jesse was downtrodden and Mike kind of helped Jesse get a spirit back by, I think actually it may have been the first half of season five. I can't remember anymore, but, uh, he had like these two guys, uh, like corner them in an alley or, or something like that. And Jesse basically, uh, helped them escape and it turned out to be kind of staged, but it was a way of getting Jesse to feel more confident. And Gus was kind of part of that planning. Do you guys remember that? Vaguely, vaguely. But another example I remember, and I think that this is, I think you're spot on that Gus is going to use this to his advantage as a way of not exactly manipulating Mike, but using what he's seeing in Mike's behavior to guide him to what Gus wants. And we saw similar behavior when Gus appealed to Walt and Walt's desire to be a man and support his family. So we've seen in the past Gus finding someone who needs a purpose and giving them a purpose. That happens to align with exactly what Gus wants. Yeah. G Gus, uh, under, d despite his abnormal psychology, he understands the psychology of others. That's right. So speaking of abnormal psychology, we saw Jimmy throw some bowling balls and he, he was uh he was trying to hit howard right <laughs> <laughs> howard sleeps in a hammock in his driveway <laughs> that was before we started recording when i couldn't stop laughing and you asked me why i had just thought of that line <laughs> that's why i was that's laughing funny. <laughs> <laughs> and also i'm gonna keep calling him jimmy because he did say that he lets his friends call him jimmy Saul yeah. is just his professional name. Yeah, but so, then he said, you can call me that too. Yeah. So it could joke. be in addition to friends. Oh, I didn't catch that. I thought, <laughs> yeah, I, I thought that was an intentional kind of, I, I thought he was just, it was an intentional kind of yeah. poke at him. It could go yeah. either way. He could be including him, maybe. I don't know. I mean, well, considering the next time we see him, he's throwing bowling balls at his car. I think Adam's uh, right on this one. Just a <laughs> prank amongst friends. Well, so in all seriousness, what is he doing here? To, to me, this felt like old Jimmy, just super childish and just lashing out. Uh, Adam, what do you think's going through Jimmy's head in that scene? Uh, uh, they made a point of showing us his whole process of sh sh he was an shopping at an antique store for a heavy object. He was practicing kind of tossing them to see. Uh, this looked so premeditated and also he was planning to do it before they even had the lunch. So this wasn't well, even a Well, to reaction. be fair, actually, to be clear, I don't know that we know that. I mean, Breaking Bad has oh, at times yeah, we don't shown know the us. Yeah, we don't know the timing. I suspect that this scene, the, what my interpretation is that this scene took place later on and they were just showing us a glimpse of what's ahead. Could be wrong, mm -hmm. though. Yeah, it's possible. Uh, well, whether it was a reaction to that or it was uh even more premeditated in either case it was still premeditated it wasn't just an impulsive thing and uh i think it's there's a chance it's just jimmy doing his usual childish petty things but there's all he's so, so clever that maybe there's something more to it i don't know it could be both it could be something childish but there's just a longer scheme here than just destroying howard's car yeah Hold on, what Maybe. do you think? Childish prank, or is there some bigger game here? I, I think he's going to try to be Howard's lawyer. What? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> <You think that? laughs> I have no idea. Dark at what? <laughs> I have no <laughs> idea what he's planning. I'm sure it's more than just you know getting even with him or something. He's definitely got some bigger plan. I I have no clue what he's planning though. Yeah, I've always been pretty sympathetic toward Howard. I think he's been, in, between Chuck and Jimmy, he was put in a difficult position much of the time. And I think he always treated Jimmy pretty fairly, considering he didn't have to. Mm -hmm. uh, and I never really thought he was, he was like, 
a douche until I saw his license plate. Namaste. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Did you take that as he's essentially had some kind of religious awakening or found some sort of peace with all the guilt he's been harboring? Mm, I got more of like a vibe of like a, like a yoga bro. <laughs> well, I think that's sort of what I'm saying. I mean, he also gave Jimmy a very long hug. So I see him mm -hmm. as he's been struggling with this guilt and he's in this peaceful, compassionate state of mind and he's trying to be he's trying to amend his wrongdoings. He's reaching out mm -hmm. to Jimmy offering him this job and I think that Namaste was an over the top way of saying of basically saying exactly that. So at first I thought that he was just kind of trying to alleviate his own guilt by extending an olive branch to Jimmy. Mm -hmm. But at the end, when he said, you're smart, you're scrappy, you're a go-getter. Uh, now, it could have been him putting on an act, but he, his face and his tone really sold it to me that, that I, I think he actually does want a little... It, the more success Saul has and the more clever things he does, the more people want him. So now the cartel wants him... Uh, Kim, at the end of the episode, wants him for something. She's come to him before for, for some craftiness. And now Howard wants a piece. Mm -hmm. No, I think that's right. I think both things are sort of true. Uh, I, I mean, part of it is that Howard has... I mean, am I wrong in saying that he's always seen Jimmy as somebody with skill? Part of the reason he always held back was specifically at Chuck's request. Mm -hmm. I think since then he has seen even more capability from Jimmy. So he genuinely wants him to work for him. But I think there he's definitely coming to him with his tail between his legs with a very apologetic tone. Yeah. But I don't think he's offering the job purely out of guilt. Agreed. And I think the, the actor for Howard, who, uh, whose name escapes me, did a great job, especially at the end of that scene. Yeah, oh, he's always done such a great job. Yeah. I mean, we've praised him so many times for managing to be somebody we see as a villain, then becomes this sympathetic character. It's a uh, yeah, super, it's super interesting character. Uh, one more thing on that topic, just uh, the fact that Jimmy throws those bowling balls at Howard's car, and whether or not there's a bigger scheme at play here, I do think it tells us that Jimmy is still harboring some resentment towards Howard and Chuck. I think in the previous episode where Jimmy had his run-in with Howard and we saw that he basically barely acknowledged him and then walked away, we thought it's in the past. He really doesn't care anymore. This seems to have brought something back to the forefront and it couldn't have been buried that deep if it was so easy to bring it back up to the surface. So I think this is kind of the first crack in the facade that we think Jimmy's got this hardened shell. He doesn't care about Howard. He's moved on. Maybe he hasn't really moved on entirely. Yeah, that would not surprise me. So I'll say in this episode, I think I hated Gus more than I've ever hated him before because <laughs> yeah. the way he treated poor Lyle, making him clean that fryer <laughs> over and over again. <laughs> I, I was waiting yeah. to see him stick that kid's like head in the fryer. Or something. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think um, Gus, like we've talked about him being crazy before and having like psychological issues. But like th this is the f one of the, uh, aside from everything else we've seen already, this is like he's he's got like a like a obsess obsessive disorder of some kind. Yeah, I think so, and I think there's something that triggers it. And at first, I thought he was nervous. He's nervously yeah. waiting for the phone to ring. But do you yeah, think that's was what it I thought? Yeah, I, I wasn't. See, that's also what I thought, and I was debating: is it nervousness? Or is it anger, where he's very confident his plan will work, but he's angry that he's been forced into this position? But I, I do think it's nervousness. I mean, it's the classic, you're waiting for a phone call. And it, it's pro tip, by the way, and I think, Alun, you'll agree with me on this. This is the equivalent of when a guy or a gal texts somebody and they're waiting for the reply back. You can't just sit there and stare at the phone. You've got to busy yourself. <laughs> Like Gus had the right idea. He should go and clean something or do something, but he shouldn't have Lyle do it. He should do it. You'd walk away and get your mind off it. <laughs> Poor Lyle. Exactly. 
<laughs> you know, honestly, poor Lyle. And uh, so I will say we last episode, Gus was kind of backed into a wall. And our question was, how is he going to get out of this? We know the DEA is going to check out these dead drops and Gus's people are going to be there. So how does he not alert them that he knows the word got out so that Nacho gets in trouble? So it turns out he let a few arrests happen. He let close to a million dollars get seized. My one question is that that guy at the end or the, the third guy that Hank and Steve Gomez had to chase, it seemed to me that he was seen on purpose and he wanted that chase to happen. It's yeah. unclear to me why that had to happen, considering they did get a few arrests already and they were able to seize all that money. Uh, and, yeah, it's a good question. I'm not sure why, given... So at first, I didn't, you know, we didn't know there were any other arrests. And so I thought this was a way to make it look like a close call, that it wasn't a staged drop. Right. Uh, yeah, that's what I thought given too. That, yeah. Given that there were other arrests, uh, it makes me less certain. Yeah, we'll have to see on the rewatch if, uh, if, if there's anything we missed in this first viewing. But yeah, when I first saw it happen, I was like, oh, that was his plan, was just to do the drop, but then have the guy run away. And then immediately afterwards, you realize that happened, yes, but there were actual arrests. They did seize some money. And by the way, how awesome was it where Hank is obviously disappointed, but he's able to turn it on for his team and give that speech. We're all going to O'Brien's. Yeah. Made me really want to work for Hank. He's a good leader. He is. And the more we see him here, the more it's so depressing knowing where he ends up. And yeah, yeah it just it, it sucks. <laughs> yeah, it does. And Kim goes to the courtroom, sees Jimmy's antics. And as always, whenever Kim sees Jimmy do some of his scummy lawyer stuff, I always wonder what her reaction is going to be. You th it's either going to be her admonishing him or her loving it and wanting to get involved. I think the writers know that we're going to be wondering that because immediately after Jimmy does his switcheroo, we see Kim for a second, but then there's a good 30 seconds where the camera is behind her head. And I keep wanting it to pan around. I want to see the expression on her face, see what's going through her head. And then when Jimmy comes back from the chambers, she says she wants his help with the whole Mr. Acker situation. So as we've seen time and time again, Kim gives Jimmy a hard time, but when she needs Saul Goodman, she goes to him anyway. Uh, yeah, how great! Right. Yeah, uh, there's a lot of Jimmy doing stuff where I wonder what his plan is. So again, here where Kim sends him to Mister Acker and gets himself hired as his lawyer, oh, yeah. what is the plan here? Uh, I, I this could really go in any direction. Uh, I can't see Saul really screwing him over that badly given he we talked about it last episode he tends to feel loyal toward his clients mm -hmm. uh, but maybe he's gonna i don't know maybe he's gonna try to get him to basically agree to leave but for more money well, what do you uh, think? That, that sounds Has, that sounds way too simple i don't know that that's not really a scheme <laughs> have uh kim's colleagues at mesa verde met saul yet i can't remember I uh, don't once know. at that that par party was that the through Mesa Verde. I think it well, I was. think I, th I think that Kim's boss, the lawyer, knows Saul. I don't know if Mesa the Mesa Verde folks do. Okay, well, don't so, you remember they were at that party and he started joking about how uh, mm -hmm. they should they should all go on a ski trip? <laughs> right. Oh, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I was just wondering if. Maybe they could just pretend they're not associated with each other. And because she wants, I mean, I think she would like for Mr. Acker to get to keep his property and for Mesa Verde to go to that other lot. So if they're not aware that Kim and Saul are together, then Saul could be his legitimate lawyer. But right. I don't know if that makes any sense at all. Well, that, that's what I was struggling with. So, Adam, you were saying you don't know if yeah, Saul would screw you, you over know, Mr. Acker. When I think about it, now that after hearing that, I realize probably 
they're going to try to get Mesa Verde to go to the other lot. Right, exactly. They are fighting on Mr. Acker's behalf. But yeah. to Alun's point, if Saul represents Mr. Acker and they turn this into a lawyer versus lawyer battle, Mesa Verde, Kim's boss, they're going to recognize Jimmy. They're going to recognize Saul. Yeah. And you got to think they're going to look at Kim and say, what the hell's going on here? Yeah, th- this might be the thing that, that gets her in, in some trouble. Yeah, which ultimately may not be such a bad thing for her if she it seems like she really doesn't like this job <laughs> yeah but i hope it I, it might i don't know if it jeopardizes her license though that's true that's true uh how awesome by the way was it um jimmy's method for winning mr acker over oh yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah i'm gonna start using that <laughs> just, just every carry a meeting. picture carry a picture of that around in your wallet <laughs> every meeting i go to that's the first thing i'm going to show them i'm just going to put it like projected on the it screen. shows up in the middle of a powerpoint you're like oh how did that get in there well now that it's here let, let's look at this for a second you see I'm now you man. notice the man is is the one doing the act the, the act yeah they're like uh alun what is this a metaphor for and you're and you go uh hey what's a metaphor this is just a picture. Uh, uh, <laughs> the horse is your client's. Wait, no. The ho- There's the, something here. The, the man is the client, and hey. you're the horse. But you're you're enjoying it. <laughs> nice. <laughs> <laughs> you right, could really you could really do it. You could really say anything. <laughs> it's funny because I wrote down for that scene how smart Jimmy is. He really knows his audience. And I think that there is a very specific audience where this will work. <laughs> uh, I don't know if there's many people besides Mr. Acker where this would have been the right move. And Adeline and I. I like how long uh, Mr. Like, Acker had to look at that photo to process that what he was really looking at. He's like, yeah. <laughs> he's like, is there? Am I missing something here? <laughs> yeah, it's absolute genius. All right, any other thoughts on the episode while it's still fresh? Yeah, uh, I noticed no Lalo this episode. I know, I know. That's always a disappointment. I even was paying attention to the opening credits. I saw Tony Dalton, and I was like, yes, that's right, Lalo. Yeah, but no, I, I had Lalo the exact same show. thought. Yeah, uh, and also uh, when – I forget what scene it was. It might have been in – I forget. At some point, you hear the sound of cooking. And uh, I thought maybe maybe we're about to see Lala, but we didn't. And more of his tacos. Yeah. <laughs> I also wonder the fifty percent off guys. I wonder if there's more to that, or have we pretty much closed out their story at this point? Because so I far see more it of seems. Them. Me too. I mean, the interaction yeah. between Saul and those two boneheads is just great. But I wonder if it's just a entertainment. B, it shows you a little bit of the problems caused by the whole 50% off and you know, a, a basically encouraging more crime. I wonder if there's more to it than just that, if we'll see more of them. Mm-hmm. And if they'll... It's almost like those two skater kids where they ended up being pretty important in terms of getting Saul mixed up with Tuco. I wonder if these 50% off guys will play a similar role or if we've basically seen everything we'll see of them at this point. Yeah, yeah. I, I think this show tends to capitalize on the characters it introduces, even the minor ones. So I think we will see them again. They also, they're good uh, comedic relief. They're like an even poorer man's Badger and Skinny Pete. Yeah. <laughs> so like it, it, if Badger and Skinny Pete are like a poor man's comedy duo, <laughs> then these are like a homeless man's Badger and Skinny Pete. No, I guess I don't know if that's offensive. Well, it's but. like Chris Farley <laughs> and David Spade. Yeah. Then it's Badger and Skinny Pete. Then it's those two guys. Yeah. And then it's Adam and Alun talking about the, no, then it's, a horse. Then it's, a, <laughs> no, no, that, then it's Wendy and the the man that she whose head she crushed with an ATM. Oh god. <laughs> in Breaking Bad. <laughs> and I don't think it gets a little lower than that. <laughs> Wait, it wasn't Wendy. It wasn't Wendy. It was a different uh skill. Gotcha. Um, I thought you were talking about Wendy's for a second. And uh, uh, no. what's his name, Adam? Go for big. What? Who? What's the name of the guy who founded Wendy's? Oh, uh, uh, I will not tell you that because you're not going to get 
Um, if you want to know what that is, what we're talking about, listen to the full take. That's a little inside joke here. Yeah, we'll explain the whole yeah, thing. Tune in, the jokes tune are in best later when they're week. explained. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I just remembered something about that I wanted to mention with the the guys that beat up Mike. Mm-hmm. Speaking, you know, speaking of hoodlums like these 50% off guys, those are also hoodlums, so good transition right there. Um Yeah, it's <laughs> even better when you explain it. Thanks, man. <laughs> yeah, so remember last time I was saying how they're they were pretty bad friends. They let Mike just break their friend's arm, and they just stood yeah. there and watched and then let him get away. So I'm glad they were able to get their revenge. <laughs> <laughs> That's a lot, everyone. <laughs> They're the good guys in this show. Yeah, they've redeemed themselves. Good. <laughs> You're glad we got closure on that, that open thread. <laughs> Okay, well, I think that wraps it up for tonight's episode. Like we said at the front, make sure to check back later in the week for the full recap and analysis. If you're listening to this or you're watching this on YouTube, check out the description. We'll link to the podcast so you can also hear that deeper analysis of the episode. Anyway, with that, thanks for listening. Thanks for watching. And we'll see you on the next Sawcast.